Hello everyone, I'm Ganna Bakrebna, I lead AI and Cyber Futures Institute and this is Data Driven Channel. It's great to see you here with us today. We've had a somewhat of a break, but today we are doing a special and this special is devoted to International Women's Day. And we will be talking about diversity and inclusion in general, but uh, in particular we will be talking about women as an underrepresented group. And today I have a special guest with me, and that's Juliet Tobias Webb, and we'll let Juliet introduce herself. Hi, Juliet. Hi, everyone. My name's Dr. Juliet Tobias Webb, and I'm a behavioral scientist. And yes, today we're going to be delving into diversity and inclusion. Um, I want to start with a pretty shocking statistic. Uh, at the moment, it's estimated that it'll take women about 200 years to achieve or have equal outcomes based on the current rate of progression. What are your thoughts on diversity and inclusion and equitable outcomes? Yeah, I think we need to start with how do we define equity? And um, I always like to talk about inclusion rather than equity because, uh, well, um, uh, prior to the, this conversation, we had uh, a little bit of a run through and uh, I told you about my, my son has a uh, you know, they've discussed inclusion and diversity at school and uh, they had a really cool phrase that I really liked and it said, fairness is not equal to equity, it's not the same as equity. And I think this kind of describes it very well because, you know, you have um, uh, people with who are underrepresented or people who might have special needs, right? And what is fair is not necessarily what is equal. So, um, uh, Ultimately, yes, I mean, you know, if we talk about, I guess we're talking about maybe pay gap here. So I think we need to be a bit more precise, you know, what is what is the 200 year gap, right? Is it is it in terms of pay? Is it in terms of opportunities? Um, and well, generally, of course, you know, even in my research, we often find that, you know, there are not equal opportunities at the start for women and men, if yes. we're just discussing these two groups. And then when we discuss the outcomes, um, I always kind of ask researchers how they can even compare men and women because at the start they don't have equal opportunities. So we can't really even compare CEOs at the same, you know, who are at the same, roughly at the same level in similar organizations, but one is female, the other male. Yeah. So yeah, these comparisons are difficult. Diversity is basically the statistics, right? So the characteristics of people, sometimes that is observable. So age, gender, um, uh, your, your background, then you've got uh, inclusion, which is how included do you feel? Are you do you feel heard? Uh, are you valued in an organisation? And then equity in terms of how I perceive equity is then you know are you are you promoted equally based on equal outcomes? Are you um, given equal pay? Are you, do you have the equal ability to be recruited and promoted and, and trained, um, so to speak, in, in, in the... So you just defined uh, equity as fairness, I think, so right, when you're getting fair outcomes. So this is, uh, but this is not how many people perceive uh, equity. So a lot of times it's defined as, you know, really like equal outcomes. And like I said, it's not necessarily correct when everyone gets the same. What are some ways that you could potentially use data or even, um, you know, behavioural science to consider how to detect whether or not there are differences in equity and fairness to then help with the solution to that? Well, the way we've done it uh, in the past, we looked at what women are talking about. Um, and, uh, well, you can do it in a number of ways. We've done it previously by looking at female speech. Uh, we just... Uh, mined uh, a large database with, uh, you know, prominent women and what they were saying in the public domain. And we assume that whatever topics that they are talking about, they actually care about those topics and they believe that they're important not only for themselves, but uh, uh, people that are being led by them. And uh, what we found was that, um, you know, there is a, a big difference between um, women as an underrepresented group uh, and women who have uh, some what we call intersectional effects. Uh, in addition to just being women, they are, for example, also black mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, have some other characteristics. Um, so essentially what we found, for example, between 
uh, women who are uh, white and who are leaders and uh, black women who are leaders uh, and lead, they could lead a large organization, they could be uh, activists and really kind of engage generally with their community. So we found that essentially if we look at white women, I mean there are many problems, uh, you know, and we look from 19th century to now and we find that every year there is a little bit of change. So which means that the focus uh, kind of shifts from one topic to the other, dependent on the year we're in. So they kind of, uh, as a group, white women are definitely underrepresented, definitely a lot of issues, but at least they see some of these issues being resolved over time. Whereas when we look at women with these intersectional effects, so who are, for example, like I said, um, uh, women and black, category, so they kind of have very persistent problems throughout um, mm -hmm. many, many years. So if we look from 19th century to now, women's rights are not so much of a problem for white women anymore, so they've moved on to some other topics. Um, but if we look at uh, black females, black female leaders, we see that it's very, very prominent uh, topic still for them. Yeah, so we can use the data that's existing in some ways, right, to find these inequities and see the patterns from history as well as the current patterns. And yeah, you need to, you also can just look at, I mean, if we are talking about a small scale, so if you are in a small organization, it's just the rhetoric that different women are using. Well, I know that I work for, you know, I work for a very diverse organization at the moment and I can tell, you know, the difference in rhetoric between different underrepresented groups, not just women, but generally we have quite a few in our organization. And, um, you know, you could analyze uh, this rhetoric if you have a way of capturing it. I know that many people use uh, uh, various products, like for example, Microsoft products, they give you some analytics and normally it's not really doing the right thing. It could be just, for example, um, it's capturing the difference in topics that people discuss rather than just telling you how many how many hours they spent using email or something like this. That would be a lot more valuable information for, I think, a CEO. That's kind of capturing people's behaviour, though, after the fact. And the only one of the problems I see with that is that people may then get defensive. So it is their own behaviour. They now see it and they don't have a chance to kind of capture it in the moment or change in the moment. So it's definitely very useful insight. Uh, what I think, what I was thinking about though, is what are some of those ways you could use technology data to be able to also help people in the moment? So um, if I think about this the other day, I was on a Zoom, a, a, a platform like Zoom called Val and, and you could see the difference in percentage of people who were speaking and who weren't. So, you know, it was saying, Juliet, you are at 30% and Matt, you were at 70 and then it was saying, okay, now Matt's spoken for a while and here's... So someone was dominating was, the conversation. No, but then it was, but it would equal out over time, which was really interesting. So it would go up and down because we would take these different, uh, you know, time to explain different things, but it also made you much more conscious of the time that you were speaking, which I thought was great because it captures you in the moment, captures your not necessarily bias, but your tendencies maybe, um, and it makes you a bit more aware of, of the other person. So I just thought it was like a great way of, of helping people be more conscious of their behaviour. How did you moment. find this experience? Is it distracting? I mean, I've, I've never used WoW, well, so um, don't really know. Uh, it, was, like, it was a little bit distracting, but it was also really interesting and kind of I, I think I left feeling more empowered that it was quite equal at the end. I don't know though if people would use the technology and then over time the differences would then just become, you know, culture, just what we do around here is that obviously the leader speaks longer or, we, you know, whether or not how long that would create sustainable change or again if it would then become a tagline sometimes like quotas where it's, oh, well, this person was just given more time because of. So it would be interesting to know the flow-on effect of, of, of that. Another thing that we've done previously was we analyzed um, um, speech mm -hmm. of CEOs and um, there is um, there are actually now databases where you know there is uh, kind of a long uh, longish uh, CEO speech and sometimes you have also chief of the 
board of the directors, you know, uh, so like there's, there's quite a lot of um, kind of top management talk being recorded, uh, especially when it's kind of financial reporting happening, something like something that is in the public domain that the, that the company normally goes out and talks to um, people about. But um, what we've done, we just looked at uh, annual reports and we looked at what CEOs were saying. And we kind of were trying to look for words, diversity inclusion in there and or related topics. And then we also looked at mission statements of the companies. So and what we found through this research was that, um, so, so essentially what we've done, so we kind of looked at these talks and then we were trying to predict uh, how likely this company to put kind of a diversity and inclusion on top of their agenda. And uh, the way we measured the outcome was there is a uh, like a ranking of companies that are most e inclusive and diverse. Um, and uh, we looked whether the company was in the ranking in the next year, if they talked about diversity and inclusion. And what we actually found was that um, it, it, mentioning diversity and inclusion did not make much difference. And in fact, it probably made things worse. Um, but what mattered was the general kind of pro-social, pro-public good orientation of the company. So if the company was um, kind of um, uh, creating a culture of, uh, you know, um, delivering the public good, improving outcomes for all people, not just the customers, not just the employees, but everybody around them, they somehow scored better in this ranking. Uh, so essentially what it tells you is that, you know, kind of stop you know, this cheap talk about, uh, you know, talking about diversity and inclusion, doing that kind of random events about it, but to try to start with values and really change the, the you know, the values of your company, uh, kind of tell everybody that, well, you know, our main goal is actually improving outcomes for everybody. And if, if all employees think that way, they, you know, they improve the culture for underrepresented groups. I know you worked a lot on education. So do you think there is too much emphasis on education or do you feel that we, De it's not enough education that we do in, in diversity and inclusion? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm going to come back to that for mm -hmm. in one moment, but I think that's so interesting around the actions speak louder than words almost because if that is, I haven't sort of heard much about this study before and I haven't heard conversations around something like how the importance of values can really shift the dial in terms of diversity and inclusion. So um, I think that's really interesting that as a leader, we, we often hear about leadership shadows. So what you say and um, what you do is very important and what you say is in some ways in, important, but if your actions aren't following through, then there's a gap there, which sounds really obvious, but actually um, I guess now the evidence is, is there and many leaders often don't divide the time to diversity and inclusion. So, you know, they may say that they are, but actually turning up to the meetings or giving people equal time, or as you said, but re really reshaping the values. So I think that's actually incredible. Yeah, I think this whole uh, value structure also helps. The, the first problem that we've identified where intergenerationally we don't see, you know, improvement in some groups. Because, well, uh, to me, what I, I normally advise managers is that, well, you kind of know your diversity scope and you're uh, in your particular unit, it could be a really small unit, but um, try to help one person. And then, you know, if all managers do that, eventually, like intergenerationally, when we look at it, we will see an improvement because you're kind of, you need to break, you know, century long stereotypes there yes. or more than century long stereotypes. And to do that, I mean, it's not enough to just you know, put everyone for an hour, in, in, in my opinion, in a, in a workshop and say inclusion is good and uh, not having inclusion is bad. But I don't know, I mean, maybe, again, maybe there is some behavioral, like new behavioral design things that you guys do in behavioral science that, that are more. So I think there's something interesting there around, we want to shift the dial in terms of changing our stereotypes, but I think as humans, we often will always bring bias to the workplace. Maybe that's an over-assumption, but at, at this stage, we're all biased in our own, on our own ways. And so um, what you generally see is in terms of training is training often does not work to shift the dial. It increases awareness. It can change people's perceptions or attitudes around diversity and inclusion and people of different, um, uh, a range of different backgrounds. But what it 
doesn't necessarily do is translate into behaviour and that's because we generally will leave the diversity and inclusion training. We say, oh, my gosh, I've learnt all this now. You know, I'm no longer biased and I'm not, um, I don't need to keep myself accountable. And I think it's that accountability piece or the ability of to have sort of humility and say, no matter what, I'm going to bring bias into the workplace. How do I make sure that I'm more conscious about that and redesign the environment in a way to better protect that? So stop focusing on changing individuals by educating um, them all the time, although that's useful again for awareness and attitude change. But how do I start to rethink the environment? And I think you can do that at an individual level. So if you're an individual, it can be thinking about reshaping the the you know, portraits on the wall or looking at, you know, um, thinking about how much attention that you're giving to ind different individuals in the workplace can be at a kind of team level as well. So thinking about uh, equal turn taking. So I think that's where that uh, vow, so the Zoom type uh, feature that I was speaking about before came into play because there's a lot around some of the best performing teams are those who have psychological safety, which is basically inclusion and that's sort of equal turn taking and the ability to feel valued and speak up. But then the leadership level as well of how do you influence values? How do you um, actually restructure the recruitment, retention, you know, mm. um, promotion pathways? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, uh, when you were talking about that, I just remembered something that might work. Uh, so maybe we need to not so much uh, say that, you know, education is kind of, you know, not, not helping or only helping, you know, awareness, like you said, but well, maybe we just need to rethink how we do that education because um, one project that we've done last year was on refugees. Um, and we kind of, the, the point was really to, so we were not specifically interested in, um, in sort of understanding to what extent they're included. We kind of just wanted to, uh, since we had a, a big problem with, uh, you know, um, a lot of refugees originated from Ukraine, so we kind of just wanted to look at inequalities between different groups of refugees. And what we found in parallel was that, um, um, so we essentially just were asking how well, you know, they, they're adapting, they're including, including into society, dependent on different um, origin of these refugees. And what we found was that there was one activity that companies did well that actually helped the refugees to sort of quickly get to know everyone and really become a part of organization. And that was joint sports events. So, um, so not so as you you know, we have in in behavioral science a lot of uh, studies on identity, and yeah. we know how it's quite easy. We can really easily manipulate identity by. Uh, you know, simple tests, right? So we have a kandinsky clint test for, yes. for, for people who don't know. I'm just going to explain that. Uh, it's basically we give people pictures by Kandinsky. These are two artists, so in case you guys don't know who these are. So um, Kandinsky is an artist and Clint is an artist, and we kind of give people our you know, selection of these pictures. And then dependent on whether they choose the majority of Clint work or Kandinsky's work as their preferable, Art, uh, we kind of put them into groups and then we make them, pl we play games basically, they have to play games. And we see immediately that people kind of in one group and the other group start kind of being antagonistic and, and all that. Um, so it's kind of the same thing, like if you have a large uh, minority, like for example, a lot of companies I know do men against women, well that's kind of the worst sports events, right? This is like the worst possible thing that you can do or you, if you do just uh, an event for women. I know that, for example, breast cancer events tend to be, I don't know, 99% women. Well, I mean, international uh, women's day events. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you have kind of, or, you know, I kind of go to this organization called Women in AI, again, we don't have many men for some reason in, in the, you know, in the room on the day, which is a shame because really what you should be doing is you should have mixed teams. Mm -hmm. um, and when you have mixed teams, then people get actually really close and they start competing together. So that really helped in, in refugee context. I, we haven't tried it in like male, female context, but I think that if we try more of those things, um, 
it uh, really would would change. Yeah, would would. would I mean, just uh, kind of speculating. <laughs> uh, we can make an extrapolation from you know the identity experiments, and we know that that works. So if we sort of you know um, impose this. Uh, competitive environments where you have to compete in a mixed team rather than just a, a team where you have a, your your own peer group in and, there. And, yeah. and so they played sports together or they followed a sports team? They played sports? No, they played sports, uh, yes. but uh, they were mixed with, uh, for example, so we did this study in the UK. So, for example, we had like such Syrian refugees and they were playing in mixed team with Brits. They yes. couldn't play Syria against the UK, so yes. they had to... And uh, so when you compare um, a situation when it was Syria against UK, uh, like no, not, nothing happened, no kind of cultural exchange happened. But when we had mixed teams, obviously they were very, um, you know, <laughs> well, that's, yeah. that's the I guess that's integrated. The, the like um, affinity bias, as they say, in some ways, uh, in terms of we often like people that are more similar to us, uh, and so when you kind of break that identity piece down, they become your in-group, not necessarily your out-group. So yeah, yeah. one of the biases that comes into play in the workplace is the affinity bias where what you often see is that people like to recruit individuals that are like them or that look like the organisation already. So it's a kind of culture fit or a person fit almost versus actually thinking about recruiting or training individuals that are different from them. So culture add is something now that's discussed. So maybe it's a kind of solution of how do we break it down so that people start to see themselves as more similar along some dimensions. But I have to tell you, I mean, I know that uh, some employers will hate me for this, but I am not a proponent of having AI interview people because that happens a lot. And I think uh, many of my students uh, told me that they've been uh, interviewed by or pre-interviewed by AI um, in, you know, in, in, in many universities that happened. Um, and uh, one of the main problems with uh, AI pre-interviewing people is, you know, we have quite a long history of uh, very biased algorithms. And um, from kind of own tests that we've done with my team, uh, we know that you can really improve <laughs> your improve improve your uh, performance with really simple things like, for example, the background, right? So, um, so for example, people with one of the algorithms that was tested, it was found that um, if you put uh, books on the background. Um, you do better than if you don't, um, right? So and um, so, so I'm very cautious about this. So we had a, a really uh, horrific uh, case in Amazon. You know, Amazon had an algorithm that was pre-selecting CVs yes. uh, for the interview, and yes. this is a big problem because I understand why companies want to do that because you've got you know, th- thousands of applications, right, uh, probably daily uh, you receive, and, and then you have to somehow filter them. Um, and this is a big problem if you have any type of unstandard CV, right? For example, if you were an academic and you decided to transfer into industry or the other way around, or say if you've done a PhD and you decided to go, instead of going to academia, you decided to go into private sector, you will have a huge problem with algorithmic mm. uh, selection of your CV. And uh, this is simply because normally people who work in this organization don't do a PhD. I mean, they first do, uh, you know, maybe bachelor's or master's or like, you know, some, some sort of a uh, like lower degree than the, than the PhD. And then you kind of, you don't have a training set with these people in. And therefore, some very good candidates might not be given a chance of an interview. But in Amazon, the problem was specifically what we're talking about with regard to women. Um, so they had a, I believe it was software engineering department, but anyway, the department where the majority of employees were male. So you would have CVs that are very, very highly male skewed experiences. and. Uh, when you uh, train an algorithm based on this, uh, obviously, if you feed a female CV, so anything that has female college in it, anything that has a female type of uh, awards, 
which some women have, and many women in STEM would have something, you know, in uh, some, some sort of recognition um, like that. So essentially what happens is you basically get not selected, even though you're a very good candidate. And I believe that they kind of kept this algorithm for quite a long time uh, until there was a, an outroar in the press, uh, so they had to take it down. But um, the reality is many companies use algorithmic decision making when they look at CVs, simply because of the volume. Yes. It's very difficult for humans to do that. And, um, you know, when we then, for example, read papers about, you know, we've sent a bunch of CVs and people were not selected, I'm not sure how much human decision making went into that. And I'm not sure how much, you know, um, a steering uh, the algorithm had from uh, someone who understands how the, you know, how it's trained and, and all that. So you need to be very careful and if you want to use AI. That's really interesting because I always assumed that AI wouldn't pick up on the contextual information, which, mm -hmm. so in terms of a CV, you know, your CV may look different based on, on your experiences and you can't explain that in a CV, so the contextual piece. But what you're also saying is it also misses parts that are in your CV but it just hasn't been trained to recognize. It's funny you say that uh, because I presented uh, um, uh, this uh, some of these results to e economics uh, audience, and uh, some economists told me, of course uh, the algorithm should select a person with books on the background. This person took time to put the books, and you know, so it's like, <laughs> so I, I think it's, um, well, the, the point is that, yeah, I mean, it kind of, yeah, it tells you that maybe people who are trained in more rational uh, decision making and do not kind of assume that oh, it should matter. It shouldn't matter. Of course, what you're saying is correct. It shouldn't matter. But um, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny how different uh, you know occupations would <laughs> would perceive that. Yeah. And can I just so yeah, this is really interesting. So so you might sit down and have a video interview, and it's AI yeah. at yours. It's questions. So so they're asking you questions and you're repeating it. Yeah, so you have to, so the way it works is you um, you have an algorithm that asks you questions, tells you, well, tell me about your previous leadership experience, let's just say you're uh, applied for a leadership role, and you have to, uh, for five minutes, record yourself. Uh, some of these algorithms allow you several runs, uh, but don't... Uh, don't think that not all runs have been analyzed. I'm sure that they yeah. analyze all runs, but you're told that only the last run is analyzed. I, I, well, I think some of the organizations are honest and really would just analyze the last run. But I mean, the, so you have like, basically I think the problem is that, well, now we're having live conversation and you know, like you are reacting to what I'm saying, I'm reacting to what you are saying. So we have a little bit of like an exchange. Um, when you're talking to a machine, you don't have that. It's yeah. kind of always the same. I mean, on the one hand, it's, I mean, I understand the, uh, the sort of the thinking behind it, that everyone, like you said, should get equal, <laughs> equal chance. Uh, but some people are not good uh, in, well, first of all, some people are not good in interviews. That's one thing. But it's one thing to have, to sit in front of a human being when you can react to, I don't know, facial expressions and you kind of are, you have a feeling how well you've done. Yes. Um, and uh, it's a quite a different experience to talk to a machine. You have no idea what's going on, right? Yeah. And you are trying to do it the best you can, but um, ultimately you have zero feedback. And just, I think psychologically for a candidate, it's very difficult. And that's quite interesting because, yeah, in interviews, you can generally see where you're answering it, answering it right or wrong when it's with another person. And not, or you can get contextual feel of yes, yes. where they want it, where they want you to take it versus the opposite. So, and on the other end of the AI, are they then saying, uh, you know, the in in the coding, and these are the type of answers we want, or how does that, how do they judge each? Yeah, I think it's just a sort of the basic, um, you know, it, it assesses some sort of basic skill, for yes. example, communication skill, mm -hmm. right? How big is your vocabulary? It might, you know, anything that has metrics. Yes. Uh, it depends. I mean, I can't give you a precise answer because different algorithms uh, sort of, uh, you know, look for different things, but it's normally something quantifiable. Uh, like, for example, how... Uh, yeah, like how big your vocabulary is based on what yours. Are you using many different words? Are you essentially repeating the same phrases? 
Um, yes. How do you um, appear? Well, some of them have this um, um, sentiment recognition, which I, like I said before, it's very problematic area. I mean, I myself have done a lot of work on emotions and I, I think there's a lot to do. It's interesting from scientific point of view, but is it at a point where we can apply and say, you know, Juliet is smiling and it means that she's happy? Yes. No, we're not at that point. But, you know, a smile could mean 100,000 different things. And so we need to essentially be very um, careful when we're applying this technology. And it's just not, it's not often considered because... Um, the people who are making decisions about recruitment, they sort of think, oh, you know, it's state of, quote unquote, state of the art algorithm. And, uh, you know, it's good enough, you know, it, uh, well, but, but no one kind of goes into the detail of what it means. Yeah. Well, it saves them time and in, in, in money in some ways, but it seems like you can lose good talent. I wonder if this was initially, I mean, obviously it's AI, so it's not initially based off this, but this reminds me of the the orchestra study in the sort of diversity mm. inclusion space where in the yeah, yeah. 70s and 80s, right, there was this um, imbalance between men and women in orchestras and often it was put down to, no, it's just mm -hmm. that men are more talented. And so they brought in blind auditions where you couldn't hear the person, you couldn't see the person coming in. So when I mean here, I mean you mm -hmm. know, whether or not you can hear them walking and then you would uh, hear them play and therefore um, just judge them on their performance and based on that, you, mm, you yeah. get more equal split. Well, see, I mean, that would be, uh, again, that would be great if they could, for example, the committee would just listen to the recordings of people. Might, yes. might, might have been good. But it's not about that. I think it's just about reducing the human component in the selection very often. So it's normally not about, not so much about equity. I mean, an equity argument is often made. Yes. That, uh, like you said, I mean, we kind of hire often the people that we um, who are similar to us. No, not in my my case. I guess, I just I'm just thinking I hired completely different people at the moment. But anyway, um, so very often people hire someone like themselves. And yeah, I mean the argument that um, companies that produce these algorithms they make that argument that you would select someone out of the box like you know, that someone you would not normally select or at least give them an equal chance. But um, in my experience with executives, I don't know, maybe you have a different experience. Uh, it's usually about just capacity. They say, you know, my HR department cannot possibly look at, you know, one million applications a year. Mm. And I need an algorithm that is more or less okay. So, like, very often I'm asked, uh, which algorithm should we rec recruit? <laughs> Because, uh, you know, we have this problem. So I think it's more of a, like economic uh, reasoning why these algorithms exist uh, in companies. But, um, you know, the inclusion component, I don't think you can make a, um, an, a, a really strong argument that, you know, it, it improves situation. I think it kind of creates bias in another direction. So would it be useful then to have like a vetting team as well? So like a team that goes through a certain amount of chooses a certain amount of CVs at random as well or something like that just to test the effectiveness of the algorithm? Yeah, I mean, that would be one one idea, you know, to actually have uh, um, maybe a kind of you take a random selection and you actually look at it. But um, uh, the problem, again, is what information you're looking at. If you're looking at the output, well, right now, again, we are talking, right, but we have cameras around us and you probably behave differently um, compared to a situation when cameras were not here. Um, again, so this is a big, um, you know, big question of like, if you just listen to the recordings, some people are just not good at recording themselves. Yes. Like I have uh, friends who would, you know, record, uh, like in, they need to do a two minute, minute recording, it would take them a week to do that uh, constant repetition. Of, you yes. know. And uh, in these things, you get maybe three chances or what, what not to record yourself. So, yeah. so, you know, like it's, and um, the worst part is when people start reading, like, you know, you often uh, encounter that in meetings, you know, when the person like prepared a speech and is reading of, of a, like a, a text and that never looks good and you know it, you will never appear natural you will never appear you know good enough so 
But I mean, coming back to the gender and, and the representative groups, I mean, I don't actually know any stats on how like women are perceived against men in algorithm. That would be an interesting question yeah. to ask. And whether or not it's like performance. So, so I think what you were getting to as well is difference between so when you've got general questions and then performance-based questions as well mm. or performance-based tasks. Sorry. So, if you were thinking, if we were thinking about the example of filming. And sometimes you're really good at filming, and other times you're you're mm-hmm. someone might not be. Sometimes, if your job has to be around being on camera, then that's a performance based metric that is useful. But if you're asked about what are your leadership qualities, then sometimes judging the difference between those is kind of it's not relevant anyway. Or it is in some ways, but you're probably better off to get. Yeah, well, but normally you have the same, right? It's like an HR policy. Everyone has to go through the same, like you said, yeah. equal, equal. That's what, what I'm talking about, equal, what is equity. So, for example, you can have, um, you know, you can have people in the organization who not necessarily will talk to anyone. Mm. Like, you know, in research, we often have people, like I know brilliant researchers who... Um, have done some really groundbreaking stuff and they don't need to talk to people much. Yeah. You know, they have normally someone, it's like in the in in the UK, we had this uh, film IT crowd, you know, there's, a, <laughs> there's IT guys who get very good at IT and then they get a manager who's talking to the outside world. But what often happens is that everyone gets kind of the same assessment initially. And then, you know, you are not um, actually promoting diversity, you're looking for equal metrics mm. in at least one skill, or whatever that skill is, that is measured by the, the AI. And uh, yeah, you never know whether you ultimately have recruited the best person, right? Mm. And, you know, so it's, the point is, I think that you achieve uh, good results, like, like I said before, when you mix people, right? So when you have a person who is maybe not a good communicator, but is, you know, can, can do other things, and then you pair them with good communicators so then jointly they do really cool work. But you will n- never be able to achieve that if you hire based on yeah. that, that type of the, that type of assessment, in my opinion. I mean, I, I guess maybe some developers <laughs> will, will, I mean, I'm uh, again, I'm not against algorithms in principle. I just think that they're not at the stage where we could put them in front of people and uh, interview uh, people. But I mean, Again, sort of, uh, so we kind of talk about jobs and, you know, and, and work. Uh, um, but, you know, all these kind of pers- different perceptions towards men and women, they have uh, evolutionary roots. So we, for example, did um, a few years back with Andrew Oswald and David Haig. Uh, we did this uh, big study with pregnant women and partners. And we found that uh, parents start discriminating between boys and girls uh, at a stage when they find out the gender of the child. Yes. So about from 20th weeks, week of pregnancy, they start treating uh, these children differently even before they are born. So normally uh, parents of, uh, um, of girls, so they basically are more risk averse than you know, parents of boys. And it doesn't have to do with hormonal changes. Obviously, there are hormonal influences. So if you have more testosterone in your blood, you would have more risk, ta- exhibit more risk-taking behavior. But um, you know, we observe this not only in uh, in a woman, but we also observe the same effects on a partner. Yes. And um, so, it's uh, you know, this is a big evolutionary pro- problem. So mm-hmm. somehow parents tend to be overprotective over girls compared to boys. And then they grow up in different uh, different ways. And we know studies when they try to kind of change and, you know, make it uh, kind of uh, create mixed gender environments or change, uh, you know, uh, fairy tale characters, uh, genders and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's all very interesting. But, I mean, we need to definitely pay attention to... And it's interesting yeah, what, what's going on with that. Through uh, doing the Supersize of STEM program, there was a lot of research as well around girls and boys in school. And basically, what they saw too was that their stereotypes, um, they start stereotyping by five onwards. But also, what you see is that even in teachers, 
you will see that boys will generally get more time to answer math questions and science-based questions and girls get more time in your home economics and, and, and whatnot. So actually you already see the difference in treatment as well at school, which is interesting in terms of how do you then shift the dial really early on. I think what education could be, right, the future education uh, could be is trying to explain to people what their bias might be mm -hmm. or is. Um, and then you are at least aware that you have it. Mm -hmm. So when you're making a decision, you can say, oh, yeah, but I tend to kind of, you know, maybe value men higher than yes. women or some people have the reverse. <laughs> I, for example, at one point had a um, had a boss who only recruited women. He yes. had didn't have a single uh, man in his team. I just had uh, he had the other, you know, the other bias. Um, so and and then yeah, it kind of all um, brings us to the question. I guess what what is the evolution, right? Considering that uh, the technology is currently replacing some of the professions, are we going to see women? Uh, you know, getting better outcomes uh, with uh, technological yeah. advances. So am I, I'll just add quickly, so you've just reminded me of an example too where I remember when I was sitting in a press conference and someone put up their hand and said, look, how do I make sure I'm equally covering men and women and, you know, people of diverse backgrounds? And the 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 response was quite general, it, you know, be more conscious, but actually one of the responses I thought that could be really useful is even tracking it, like using metrics to think about at some stage how many, like putting stats to it to make yourself a little bit more aware. Not always easy and simple mm. for, for people, right, but sometimes useful in terms of capturing that bias and, and becoming more aware of it or looking at the amount of time you might spend in different meetings or speaking to different individuals, like looking at your social circle, if it's all all uh, people that think the same or look the same or are of the same gender, then how do you start to, to shift the dial in, in some ways? But I think then moving on to the, the next phase is something that I find really fascinating and an interesting kind of place to explore is what will the future look like for men and women? and the yeah. in the diversity and inclusion space. Yeah, I mean, we kind of can backtrack a little bit to COVID because, you know, during the COVID we, well, you know, uh, generally, I mean, I think there is, uh, we still don't know how to deal with career career breaks really well. I mean, I, I, I saw that in kind of in Australian context, especially, I see more and more that there is, it's okay if you had a career break, you can still apply for this opportunity if you had a career break. But um, we also had, uh, you know, situations during COVID where people did not have a career break, but they were the main carer and the majority of main carers were women. Uh, so if, you know, if you have small kids and, and all that. So, um, um, I mean, what I hope to see is that this new technologies that we have uh, will actually allow women to quicker catch up with you know especially in stem if you missed one month it's a big yeah. gap so um so i'm hoping that the new technology will actually help them to uh to kind of catch up really well or like on the really quickly on the trends uh of what was the, what they missed so that would be really i think an, an important important thing um, and also, I think, you know, when we talk about the skills for the future, we always talk about the transferable skills. So we know that machines can do creative stuff, you know. So of course we thought, oh, creativity will be the next thing. But actually, no, it's, it's transferable skills. It's when you can kind of switch from one task to the next, or when you can uh, be the person who gives uh, instructions. So I just learned from my husband that there is this um, new... Um, uh, new specialization called prompt engineering is when uh, you actually direct AI. So you you structure um, requests for AI-generated agents in a way that it gives you the best output that you want. And I mean, in all these tasks, uh, psychologically, women actually are better than men because women, are, we know, psychologically, women are better multitaskers. We know that women are better at, uh, you know, um, formulating uh, kind of plans, right, and all that. So uh, all these planning things like this. So definitely there are a lot of advantages for women, 
But again, it's like devil is in the details, right? So, so how is it going to be executed? So we might kind of come coming back to the start of this conversation. So we might actually catch up on this 200 year year gap, but we also might ex extend, extend it, it uh, if we are not lucky, because uh, it just depends on um, kind of the maturity of organizations who will be implementing these um, uh, these new technologies. And it's interesting. So I want to come back to first of all career career gaps mm -hmm. because I always think about what you learn in your career gap, like right. So t tell me that the negotiation skills or the functioning on sleep deprivation and the learning on the job of when you've had a child doesn't contribute to new flexible thinking that is different, right, from men staying within the jobs. How do we nudge? men who are leaders or in organisations to take their break as well so then there's equal outcomes or shift the social norms so it's not no longer onus on one but actually two people by default they don't always want as equal involvement. Yeah I mean policy wise that's definitely true in many countries that men don't get the same I mean I just know from my own child that um, it didn't happen in Australia but you know yeah for example my husband couldn't take leave like subsequently to me yeah. like he had to take it just when the child is born which is uh which is crazy like you would want to kind of swap or you know like you could you, you could do kind of longer ultimately you could care for the child longer at home rather than kind of put them into like daycare or somewhere else but um yeah i mean this is a big um you know, like, like I said, it could be a big opportunity, but it could be a, a big cost if we, you know, if we consider how it will change. Yes. Um, um, I'm not sure we will see the cultural change. It would be great. <laughs> I'm not sure how to do that with technology. But um, maybe if, you know, men had more opportunities to work from home and, you know, do some, like, more flexible uh, uh, kind of, well, be, the employers were more flexible with this. Um, then perhaps it would happen over time. But I think we also need to think like if we have the kind of current status quo, like what can we do, right? If uh, um, I don't care if I don't know, chat GPT uh, lets women write reports quicker or, you know, can help them in writing reports quicker, then maybe it's a good thing. But if uh, chat GPT makes up a lot of stuff that does not exist, you know, and carries a lot of errors and makes, creates more work, for women, then maybe it's not such a great technology to adopt in the workspace. So it's all, um, you know, it's it's all needs to be kind of carefully considered um, before we kind of go to this next step. I mean, I personally think that technology um, can do a lot of good and uh, it could be used as a social lift and could be equalizing people. But at the same time, we saw in, on many occasions how that didn't happen. So we kind of, I'm cautiously optimistic there, but I'm hoping that uh, going forward we'll be, we'll be able to better evaluate technology on how it's approaching different underrepresented groups, men, women, um, uh, you know, men versus women, or you know, other underrepresented groups versus uh, majority groups. And I think, um, yeah, it all would depend on how well we select these technologies yeah. in the future. So why I have like a healthy pessimism against, um, against uh, education in some ways, right, versus restructuring mm -hmm. the environment, you're saying have a healthy pessimism coming into the technology space. So, you, you know, yeah. you might have the experimentation and but make sure that you're kind of even just having conversations with the people at the end of yeah, the I think, pipeline, right? Yeah, so this is, I think, uh, you 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 are exactly right there. So I always say that if you, look at, you know, as a developer who, like, I develop stuff uh, that may or may not be used, <laughs> you know, in their own way. So, uh, so the best uh, thing to do is always to ask somebody who is not in your field. Yeah. So... Normally, I would go to a lawyer or an ethicist or a qualitative person who does not know anything about numbers, but can see through the consequences of this technology being developed. And um, this usually helps. So again, we're coming back to the point of diversity. You know, you will need to have all these different uh, opinions in the organization. So I think it's, uh, it's extremely important to have a second opinion on, you know, 
who 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 potentially could be harmed by by technology and uh, um yeah i think it's there's not enough thinking in that direction done by organizations although we do see po po positive shifts uh, you know towards that because you know even the most benign piece of technology could be used uh, to uh, create further inequalities um and um it's you know there is a it's a basically there is a very small difference yeah it's it's kind of a very very small uh, tiny border between you know being good and being evil and um, yeah you need to be just very careful don't entirely trust uh, the a piece of technology you always need to have human checks and balances and making sure that it's all working yeah, which is hard because sometimes organisations move quite fast, right? So once and they assume it's just it's working well or it works well enough. Which yeah, I mean, is not necessarily the, the the right outcome. Yeah, I mean, uh, just like you said, having a conversation. I think in Australian context, we have a big problem with um, you know First Nations or Indigenous population, uh, simply because uh, we haven't done enough asking of. Uh, relevant groups, what they mean, what they, how they interact with technology, you know, because, um, so we do have, uh, there is a, a paper that I know by N.J. Abdila, who uh, with a group of uh, collaborators wrote that it's, uh, you know, indigenous view is not human-centered technology, but it's country-centered technology, right? But then we have no idea how that translates into actual piece of technology. Like, how do we make country-centered piece of technology in practice, yeah. right? And I will not be able to make that piece of technology unless I directly talk to um, to indigenous people, to First Nations people, who will tell me, you know, this is how we see it. And then uh, within the indigenous community, there's a lot of diversity, right? Because we have 200, over 200 languages in Australia and all that. And everyone needs to be asked. And we need to form a view first of what it is and how to best cater to, to their needs mm -hmm. because there is technology that they engage with. Like for example, we recently did a study in the banking context and we found out that, uh, you know, uh, based on kind of the um, representative sample of Australian population, if we look at the products that uh, Indigenous people engage with, they tend to engage more with... Um, um, any offer that they are getting from, you know, Offers. from a, 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 any offer, yeah. And obviously not all these offers are beneficial to them, right? We we are talking about chronic debt, with mm. talking about poverty, lots of problems. And um, no one asked how to deliver information correctly to First Nations groups so that they could make informed decisions about, you know, what is good for them like what products are good for them. Mm. And not to mention that all these products are developed based on uh, an average person in the city, living not in rural area, living in the city, thinking about city problems. And it completely doesn't take into account the social aspect. You know, mm. it's not about the mob. It's not about the community. It's about individual. It's a very colonial view. Mm. And what we need to do is we need to be asking them what, what it means. Similarly with women, like you said, there's not enough conversation of what, you know, what would be the technology, most of, te as you know, most of technolog technological advancements are, again, made for, very specific environments again and and there is no dif you know diversification there in terms of okay we will uh, produce this thing for a female segment and this thing for male segment it's like um what's this uh, dating app um tinder right we had tinder and there is one for women which the name escapes Bumble. me yeah that where women can make a choice but you see like this he made a huge differentiation in the market because this is the thing that uh, appealed to women, right? And yes. it was uh, segmented to women. And we have very little done in that, you know, in with, with segmentation like that. So it's usually just one average person, whatever that is. Okay, so thinking about uh, something that you told me earlier today, and that's around how algorithms work with different populations. So uh, you were speaking about sort of, you know, you could train uh, an algorithm to, 
make decisions based on a, a First Nations uh, population. You could train an algorithm to uh, make a decisions around you know a, a women's population or men's population, but they don't necessarily speak to each other. So yes, yes. So I mean uh, that uh, the the best um, example is probably um, facial recognition algorithms. Yes where uh, we can make an algorithm that will so currently the problem is that if we have if we have it it recognizes white males very well but if we take for example a, a, a black female we will not be able to recognize correctly yeah can i just that famous mm -hmm. mit example of the the um african-american lady who the the algorithm wouldn't detect her face, but if she put on a white mask, it would detect the white mask as a face. And then if you take off the white mask, actually, it would then not detect her face again, which I find fascinating. Hmm. In, well, I, I very often have this problem because I wear glasses and the cameras don't recognize my face because I wear glasses. So we have very often this uh, this issue when I'm being photographed that, you know, there's no <laughs> the cameras. The, obviously, the AI behind the cameras the, 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 is not trained. So the machine learning algorithm that is trained is not really recognizing well people with glasses because not many people in the public domain uh, take pictures in, in yes. glasses. So it's not, you know, so, but, but uh, coming, coming back to this thing, so we can make a, an algorithm that will recognize, uh, uh, you know, African-American, just generally black females um, from whatever country uh, very well. We can we can make that happen. What the, the challenge is to to make, to create a universal algorithm that will very well uh, recognize um, white males, and Asian people, black people, and so on. So like it's very very difficult to make a universal algorithm like that. Yes. And that's the and that's the key. And this is why this technology is essentially dying like you know there is uh, uh, quite a few large companies pulled out of facial recognition ibm i know doesn't do it and some other companies said that they will not do facial recognition anymore because it's very difficult to make it like i said fair equal um inclusive yes um and yeah the, this is um um, this is kind of one side of the problem. <laughs> Another side of the problem from the training sets that you mentioned is also the uh, kind of the um, the fact that you know people with different platforms uh, they get different treatment, and as we know, there is a lot of a lot more information is gathered from just generally from uh, uh, people in the you know in in the global south. Who have tend to have Android phones, yes, and not so much from people who have uh, iPhones, <laughs> yes, uh, who tend to live in cities. So what's going on is we normally kind of have uh, data that we get from rural areas, uh, and we train it to create algorithms that we primarily use in. So it's rural, a yeah, sample. It's kind of like city that's areas, best. urban areas, yeah. Yes. So, um, so uh, I mean, my legal. <laughs> Colleagues would call it exploitation. Yes. Um, I'm not going to use strong words like this, but uh, yeah, there are inherent inequalities in how uh, data sets are used. So we, you know, we get data from certain groups uh, without giving anything back to these communities, right? So they uh, essentially are providing uh, labor data, personal data. Um, for free, or almost for free, and they're not getting the tools that would support these particular communities. Um, so, I mean, part of the reason, so, so Institute, uh, my Institute, the AI and Cyber Future, so what we do is we're trying to kind of put back the emphasis on the rural communities and see how we can actually, uh, you know, provide the value back to the rural community. Uh, yes. And can you give me an example of one case, if you... Of, of um, the algorithm that was uh, kind of designed on, say, a rural community used in a well in, in mobile. So there is a lot of um, um, there, there is a lot of um, uh, alg algorithm. There are a lot of algorithms that were developed um, for mobile phones. Yes, uh, basically. 
Okay. Again, you know, fingerprinting, uh, so facial recognition, uh, some of the things that measure physical metrics. And what's the, a lot of them are. You what's know, the reasoning great. to test? Is it? It's just cheaper. Okay. Uh, just again, we kind of went back to money. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's uh, it just tends to be uh, well. It's. Uh, uh, the Android, um, uh, I mean, currently I think there are some uh, discussions around uh, who is collecting more information because I think uh, iPhone started to collect contextual information a few years back. Um, so not so much about who you are, but where you are, like what, <laughs> you know, what is the area around you and all that. But um, the, um, you know, the, the, essentially the the majority of people who are like in, in the south they use uh, android and android collects a lot of data on your behavior online uh, if you have a smartphone android phone um, and uh, yeah so pretty much uh, any function in android phone that you can think of was trained uh, based on large amounts of data from rural populations or populations from uh, developing countries, let's just say, uh, that tend to be rural. I mean, some of them are not, maybe, but, you know. So this is something that we just need to keep in mind. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, but um, but are there any segments? that? Uh, I mean, when you are, well, this is, again, kind of the conversation about privacy paradox. Uh, you know, when we, uh, again, ask people, do they care about privacy? Everyone says yes. But when uh, people install install applications, they don't read terms and conditions, and it would take, um, I think, over 240 hours or something like this for a person to read all terms and conditions. But it's not like you can opt into some terms and conditions. I think that's the problem. Like, there's been times where I thought about it, and I'm like, well, I really. I mean, this is that. a good uh, argument that was kind of made to me by again one of my colleagues who is a lawyer ethicist, because normally the developers response to that, well, just don't use the app, right? Um, but uh, yeah, so I heard this opinion before that, uh, you know, um, not using an app might not be an option. Like, for example, if you're, you want to stay in touch with your parents and your parents are on Facebook, now Meta, so, you know, you as much as you hate Facebook for everything that was happening with privacy on Facebook, you kind of are forced to use it because your parents just use that technology and it's difficult to, you know, teach them something else, that they're, you know, elderly people, something like that. So so this whole argument about, you know, just don't push the button if you don't want, don't want to watch this channel or don't download this app if you don't want to use it, uh, doesn't actually work that well. Um, how to protect yourself? Yes, I mean, make sure that you don't share. I mean, normally the the... Don't kind of accept the defaults, basically. Yes. <laughs> this is how you protect yourself. Don't share, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, ge geotrackers, like the, your, yes. your location information with the app. Don't say yes to, can you know, can I access your camera to everything? Like, yes. okay, if it's Instagram, you know, if it's a, some... Um, app that is specifically for taking pictures, maybe, yes, you want to share camera, but uh, uh, if it's, I don't know, uh, uh, a torch, yes. <laughs> and yeah. it wants to track your location and uh, take pictures, then say no to this. A torch is a torch. It doesn't have need to have, uh, you know, access to your photos and to your geographical location. That's yes. silly. So, yeah, I mean, just to kind of take uh, precautions, look, always look at what uh, data uh, is being, like, we uh, a lot of times ask people, do you know what, you know, what this app is accessing? And they say, uh, they have, uh, they have, uh, many of them say yes, but then when we ask specific questions, uh, because some of the apps uh, can read your text messages, for example, yes. and people don't realize that, right? And, and. This is the thing, like, you just need to be, like you said, more aware of what, you know, what, what is happening. And, um, yeah, in terms of privacy, people um, just uh, recklessly uh, donate to their personal data. So there was a very, I always uh, give this example in my lectures, so there is a famous um, artist, she's not a, an experimentalist or anything, um, who did a... Um, 
so he, her last name is Punio. Uh, I don't, I forget the first name. But basically, she, what she did was uh, in New York City, she baked some um, cakes, yes. cookies. Uh, and uh, she went to a fair, a New York fair, and she stood outside with the, you know, trolley with these cookies. And uh, you could buy the cookie, but not for money, but for your personal data. And um, uh, 380 people, I might, you know, here or there, kind of, might have, well, plus minus one person, stopped out of them half, gave her four last digits of their social security number, and one third of people gave her the fingerprint. And was there a difference? For a cookie. Ah, that's, and was there a difference in, I mean, I wonder if that's just, everyone's got our information now, it's too hard to keep track of, again, we didn't, we don't have control. Like, you think that there are differences in gender, considering the diversity and inclusion and International Women's Day, in terms of how apps might access the data. So, so who says yes or no to the default? Um, right. So we don't. Yeah, we usually do not find gender differences. Sometimes we do find age differences. So it's more of a, like elderly people might be more Trusting. at risk. Yes. Uh, but again, not all the time. So it's more a behavioral factor. So that's why I always say, like, don't look at demographics, look at what people do, because segments are normally about how they perceive risk. And mm -hmm. again, we have measures for that. Um, but in terms of uh, how the data is harvested, I'm sure that it's harvested uh, in different ways from women and men. Like, I think it probably would be, let's just say, if I... Um, if I wanted to find out a lot of uh, information about women, um, I probably would make questionnaires around weight mm. or, you know, something like appearance. Um, uh, whereas with men, you would have to do something something else. It will not be like, yes. you know, f f maybe it's fitness, but not so much weight. So, right. So you could... Mm, it's a little bit like with the Facebook questionnaires that are not really there to find out how, you know, how how well you are partnering with someone or you you know is your husband good for you or not. Uh, so it's just there to to kind of get information about you. And the yes. hooks normally for women, I would have thought, would be different. And what about for intersectionality? In do you think the the research isn't there in terms of? whether or not there are differences in the decision-making aspect, but also in the harvesting? Um, so I think that there's definitely a lot of research in intersectional, sort of how, uh, you know, people with intersectional characteristics um, approach different types of technology. Um, but again, you know, we kind of, uh, this research is very difficult to publish for the reason that, um, that we kind of we discussed these reasons at the start that in order to compare uh, for example even women to men mm -hmm. you would make to make a very you would need to make a very convincing argument that everything is equal apart from this and um, that's very difficult and, and and that's why I think um, there is definitely research I mean there is research not only in quantitative fields, but in sociology, you know, these intersectional effects are, are uh, well understood uh, through interviews, right? But, uh, um, yeah, again, normally you just look at one group at a time, and uh, this kind of prevents us from making any comparisons and understanding to what extent, you know, this group is disadvantaged compared to this group. Yes. So I think it's uh, just... Uh, at that level, very difficult to compare. Uh, and will it change? I'm, I'm hoping that it will. But, you know, like we have now quite a lot of initiatives in science. I know that nature has a special um, yes. addition even on, you know, black uh, populations and generally on, you know, e equality and, and all that. So, um, so I think, yeah, there's definitely uh, steps <laughs> towards making it better, but is it improving? Uh, are we understanding better the gap? So do we understand the problems? Yes. Do we understand the gap? I'm not sure. Kind of. So it doesn't have as rich of 
richness of data in so when you're hiring something. people you're asking or just the... oh sorry what i meant by that is in the in the app design oh, in the app. so like you probably don't have as much granular or when you're signing up to certain apps or products as well, much as you yeah it's kind of like when we talk about personalization so you can have um basically a questionnaire when we you directly ask and and there are some contexts where people gladly give their personal information and that would it actually makes sense for example if i buy clothes i go to a shop and i need to buy online something i would you know it's in my best interest to give them my size you know, and, and, and some other characteristics to make sure that whatever I buy fits, yes. right? Um, but then uh, there's normally, um, you know, the, the kind of the unobservable yes. bit for the consumer where uh, to personalize some, some offers to me, they would also look at what I'm buying. And there we kind of, uh, it's a different conversation, but... Um, we are kind of stepping into a different um, uh, domain where, you know, not everything that I buy I like uh, and that kind of stuff. And it's always assumed that if I bought something, it means I like it. That's my preference mm -hmm. to buy it. So it's, it is um, generally very problematic. And, you know, um, coming back to the beginning of the conversation, so th that's why this intersection, or well, in my personal biased opinion, <laughs> Uh, the intersection between behavioral science and data science is so valuable because it kind of gives you an understanding of how people behave and that, you know, what the data captures is not necessarily preferences, you know, and, and, and all that. But yeah, I mean, uh, I imagine that you could have um, products that are particularly targeted at certain groups and would be beneficial for them or maybe would be likely to quote-unquote, exploit data from one group more yes. than the other. Like I said, I mean, everything that has to do with weight, uh, probably females would be a lot more. Well, it's like the social media me. side of uh, Instagram where they found young women were experiencing, uh, were getting sort of, were experiencing more mental health issues mm. with work, working with Instagram. Yeah, I mean... So things like that, right, where there's different risk categories. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, we, I, know, I don't know whether... I'm not on top of the most current statistics, but I know that just uh, very recently it used to be that, for example, Facebook was a primarily female mm. uh, thing, but Twitter is primarily male. So, like, you know, it's short uh, kind of messages. These are kind of more male. Uh, I don't know about LinkedIn, for example, what their demographic is. So, but, but yeah, I mean, the, there is definitely a uh, kind of, you know, the way technology engages with you makes it makes a difference. Mm. Yeah. Um, and can lead to unequal um, yeah. outcomes. Well, it's because the information you're being sent, right, is either in certain as a language or text, as, as we're talking about, sentiment in some ways or values coming through experiences. Okay, so let's wrap up. I want to ask you, if you had uh, a magic wand, what are three things that you would either tell leaders about or change in organisations to help advance diversity and inclusion? Working with values rather yes. than working with, um, you know, educational programs and, you know, having one day a year or two days a year when you say, okay, we want to be diverse and inclusive and actually put, pay attention to this social good as a, you know, as a value for, for the company. Then I would say concentrate on individuals. Yes. And, um, you know, have conversations with people. This is the sort. So ask people. We, uh, just to give you an example, as you know, cybersecurity is a very dry, boring subject. <laughs> and everyone kind of considers it to be a dry and boring subject. But, um, and a lot of people think that only quantitative people should be asked. But when we do ask people, uh, from the entire organization, not only those who work in cybersecurity to express opinions about cybersecurity, it turns out that people have very strong opinions and uh, they should be heard. So, mm -hmm. you know, the more people contribute to the understanding of what technology should be, you know, put into procurement plans or put into action uh, in the organization, the more people have uh, this conversation with the management, the better the outcome is going to be. Yes. 
So I don't know if you have maybe some, some I guess maybe perhaps more on a behavioral, uh, from a behavioral perspective. Do you, yes. do you have some other things that you, you think that might be useful for leaders? So I think the no, one of the number one ones is that shift from just focusing on education, but really thinking about restructuring the environment by accepting that we are. We all have our own biases, so how do you get better outcomes? And, and part of that is the ex- we're still in that experimentation phase. I think from speaking to you, without repeating the ones that you've said, is also um, realising that that bias is also still within a lot of the technology that's um, around today but also coming. So having a healthy um, uh, ability of kind of looking at that, so scepticism in, in some ways, right, So and pessimism and building ways to check the data or the bias that might be inherent within that technology is quite important. And I think just reiterating the touching in with those individuals um, from a broad range of, of uh, different, uh, different backgrounds and, you know, figuring out how you can continue to, to add into that. So they would maybe be mine. Um, and I think I'm just trying to have a look at if I wrote anything else. Oh, the in-group, out-group I thought was quite an interesting one. So just remembering that sometimes it's about how do we break down the barriers by putting people from diverse backgrounds or in in groups where they're then seen as, um, they de- then identify with each other. Well, we have provided you, I guess, with some thoughts today and I just want to thank Juliet. I think uh, the format was a kind of, I feel, <laughs> not exactly the interview, but a conversation. And um, uh, thank you all for joining us and um, we'll see you next time. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah, I found that absolutely fascinating. So thank you, everyone.